Hello, Bravs. We're back with The White Cat by Gillette Burgess. Starting the second part of the book, chapter one. My machine had been repaired for a week, but I had not had it brought up to town. When I received the note from Leah, it was dated Tuesday. Come down immediately, she wrote. If you can think of a plausible pretext, but don't say that I sent for you. Miss Fielding will not ask you herself, but we need you very much. I trust to you. I took an early afternoon train the next day and finding no one to meet me at the station, engaged the carriage to take me over to Miss Fielding's place. My driver would, I am sure, have been glad to gossip with me upon the lady's affairs, but I headed off all his hints, knowing pretty well from Uncle Jordan's insinuations what the tenure of the neighborhood talk must be. Mid Meadows was about four miles from the station and a half mile back from the county road. The house was approached by two long lanes overgrown with shrubbery and hazels, one from the seaside on the east and one from the main road on the north. We took the latter, a wild and tangled wagon track filled with stones and hummocks and worn into deep holes. The boughs of trees constantly scraped across the top of the buggy and often hung low enough to threaten our eyes. Near the house, the lane took a turn round the corner of an extensive old-fashioned garden of hollyhocks, rose bushes, poppies, and violets, then swung up to the green, eight-paneled front door with its transom of old bullseye's panes, bullseye panes. The cops came in close to the garden, partly enclosing it on two sides. To the right of the house, vegetables were planted with meadows beyond, and behind, the hill rose almost from the stable. The whole place had a charming, natural wildness, and seemed as indeed it was miles away from any other human habitation. But it was not uncared for. Its natural features had been amended and composed with the care of a true artist. The house itself was long and low, covered with unstained shingles. A great square brick chimney rose from the middle of the gambrel roof. The lower windows were leaded and built out into wide bays, but they showed above the little paned ashes of the original building. The front was almost hidden by climbing Cecil Bruner roses, now odorously in bloom. The southern side was lined with a row of geraniums, which rose in huge bushes. Here in the second story was another bay window of curious construction, somewhat resembling the stern of an old galleon. It was Miss Fielding's sitting room, which I had not yet visited. The place seemed deserted, for not even the dogs were visible. I got out and knocked while my driver waited curiously to catch what was probably a rare glimpse of the mistress of the house. Joy herself wearing a white duck sailor suit with a red handkerchief knotted about her neck answered my knock. She held her hand to her eyes to shade them from the rays of the afternoon sun so that I could not at first quite make out her expression. The first thing she showed after her surprise was a most cordial satisfaction at seeing me. She did not apparently expect me, but my presence delighted her. I saw next that she was in trouble. The very intensity of her welcome alarmed me. The two vertical lines between her brows were deeply cut into her forehead. Her lips were quivering. There were dark circles under her eyes. She drew me quickly into the library, and I saw terror in her look. Her cheeks were pale and wan. Her hands trembled as it her hand trembled as it lay on the back of a chair where she leaned. Oh, I am so glad you have come. Had been had been her first speech murmured in the hall, and it was repeated now as I stood before her. I am so glad you have come. I need you so. I had fancied before that her face was one capable of expressing tragedy. That every woman's is. Tragedy shadowed her face now, giving her a newer, more dramatic beauty, so moving that, despite my alarm, I could not help wondering at it. You are not well, I exclaimed. Oh, well enough, she replied. Something is the matter. What is it? Sit down, and I'll try to tell you. She dropped into a chair with her elbow on the table, letting her cheek fall into the hollow of her palm. Her eyes closed for a moment, the soft, long lashes shading her pale cheek. Then she shook herself and sat erect. I'm so sleepy, she moaned. I haven't slept since night before last. I sprang up from the window seat. Won't you lie down here and rest? Do, I pleaded. Oh, I don't dare. I don't dare, she cried. 
Tell me what is troubling you so that I may try to help you. She looked up and said, Leah has gone. I thought she was talking to Leah. He was talking to Leah. And she put out a hand that trembled with a despairing gesture. Gone, I repeated. Where? I don't know where. I don't know when she went. I don't know even why. Do you fear she has met with an accident then? Oh, no, not that. Worse than that. She spoke helplessly. Worse? I could not understand. I mean, I think I must have driven her away. I still could not guess. Why? How could you have done that? You mean that she took offense at something, perhaps? Oh, I must have made it impossible for her to stay. Well, but, but what did you do? She was devoted to you. She sprang up and wailed out with bitter vehemence. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. If I only knew, I could do something. But what can I do now? She's gone. She was my right hand, my eyes, my ears, my memory. But it's not that. It's that I could have been cruel enough to her to drive her away. Where is she? Where could she have gone, do you think? I've waited and waited to hear from her or from her to come back two whole days. I didn't go to bed at all last night. I didn't dare lest she should come while I was asleep. You expect her to return then? She was walking up and down the room, her hands clasped behind her back tightly. I could see that she was on the verge of hysteria. She turned to me again and said, Oh, Leah would never abandon me. Never. She's too true for that, but she's afraid to come back. I went up to her and led her gently to the seat. Now, I said, tell me exactly what was happened. What has happened? She broke out again wildly, her face twitching with excitement. I don't know. Don't you see I don't know? That's the horror of it. I may have killed her for all I know. Ah, well, do you mean I began afraid to say it that you've forgotten? She stared at me. Forgotten? Well, you may call it that. Yes, I've forgotten. She put her face into the pillow and began to sob convulsively as the crackheads pull up. After this nervous crisis had spent itself, she sat up, wiped her eyes, and said with a faint spectral smile, Oh, I'll have to tell you everything now. I can't bear it any longer. It was bad enough while I had Leah to depend upon, but now I must have somebody to confide in, or I shall go mad, if I haven't already gone mad. I looked over at the table where I'd noticed a coffee pot and a cup on a sil salver. How much coffee have you drunk, I asked. Oh, I don't know. Cup after cup. I've been drinking it all day to keep me awake. That accounts for your nerves. You must rest. If you sleep a little, you'll get your strength back. She sprang up suddenly, her grip fist raised, her head thrown back in a sudden new access of alarm. Oh, no, no, no. You don't understand. I daren't sleep. I'm afraid. Afraid. How do I know what may happen now when I'm so worn out? I had done considerable thinking while I was away, and I had done some reading as well. I was beginning now to make it out piece by piece and put it together in an astonishing whole. It was too late in this crisis for reserves, too late for me to keep to my promise of not trying to know. The girl was distraught and alone, and indeed the door to the cupboard where her skeleton had been hidden was now well ajar. You are afraid, you mean, of the other one. I brought it out deliberately. She stared at me like a somnambulist. Yes, she whispered, of the other one. Then for the first time, and quite unconsciously, I think, she used my name. It seemed so natural to me that I was not surprised. Oh, I'm so glad you know at last. Chester, I'm so glad that it will be easier to tell you. She put her hand on my arm and looked up at me in tenderest, tenderest confidence. Now you know why I called myself the White Cat. Yes, I see. Don't be alarmed. I'll help you. You must calm yourself and we'll find out a way. I know her, you know. Yes, I know you do. You must tell me all about her sometime. How oh, you must have hated me. Perhaps I can manage her, but no matter about her now, we must think it all out and decide calmly what to do. I'm not afraid. Trust me, and I'll see you through. It will all come out right, I'm sure. I went on so, purposely iterating such phrases to lull her and key down the intense strain which wrought upon her. Her eyes kept on me, and I saw my influence work, my suggestion, I might say, since it was purposely hypnotic. Her hysteria made her abnormally sensitive, sensitive to the treatment. She relaxed her attitude slightly, sighed, and dropped back among the silken pillows behind her. Oh, you're so good, she breathed. 
You will help me, I'm sure. You have helped me already. You're so strong. It's such a comfort to have you here. She reached her hand out shyly and put it in mine, where it lay, small and cold. It was the first time she had done so, except under the direct stress of an earnestness, strong enough to rob the act of any personal suggestion. It was the distinct caress, fearless and genuine. Now, I said, begin at the beginning and tell me all about what has happened. She took it up again with a new courage. As I've said, I don't know when Leah left. I only know that when I rang for her yesterday morning, she didn't come. I went into her room and she wasn't there. She wasn't downstairs. King didn't know anything about it, nor Uncle Jordan. Uncle Jordan has been away for three days visiting his nephew, who's ill. You see, she, the other one, was here for two days running. It hasn't happened so for years. So whether it happened, whatever did happen, on Monday or Tuesday, I can't tell. Leah might have left either day. How do you know that the other one was here for two days? Only because Sunday is the last thing I remember before yesterday morning. The doctor was down, was down then. You know that there's a hiatus when she's here, a perfect blank in my memory. I lose time as she does when I'm here. Her mention of the doctor started a new train of thought, but I put that by for the present to tell her of the letter I had received from Leah, which made it probable that she had left on Tuesday, the second day of the other one. The situation was serious enough, I was sure, for me to disobey Leah's injunction to secrecy. Oh, said Joy, that relieves my mind a little. It shows that Leah had a plan, and she must have stayed somewhere near here, expecting you... Though how she happened to miss you, I don't see. It's quite right for you to have told me, for I had already telephoned to you today after you started. I was surprised to see you appear so soon for that reason. I was at my wit's end yesterday, but I hated to drag you into this. But what could I do? Dr. Copen has gone out of town for a few days. I'm glad you sent for me, I said. I shan't have to feel that I'm intruding. But now the question is, why doesn't Leah come back? Why didn't she wait for me at the station? She must have been awfully frightened to have gone away like this, Joy said. Perhaps she discharged her. I know she complained of Leah a good deal. Yes, I thought of that, but I fear it's even worse. In any case, there's no reason why she shouldn't come back now that the other one has disappeared, I said. How can Leah tell, Joy exclaimed. How will she know whether it is I or the other one? who were really the same person outwardly. There's no difference that she could recognize unless she talked to me. That's what has terrified me. Then for the first time, I saw the, di the dilemma. How indeed could Leah know? The same woman, the same clothes, but yet how different. Have you no sign, I asked. Haven't you ever arranged it with Leah so that she can tell? Oh, not for a case like this. It has never been necessary. You see, the change always comes at night at least always during sleep, so that when I wake up, she can tell right off by asking me what I'll, what I'll have for that. Ugh. By asking me what I'll have for breakfast. We've arranged it so that I shall always give a fanciful reply and let her give an obvious commonplace one. But now Leah daren't come in, for she knows that if I should happen to be the other one, there'll be the same terrible something that happened before, a quarrel or worse. Still, there are some apparent differences. You dress different, differently, it seems to me. You usually wear white. Won't Leah know by her experience of you both? Oh, no. You can't tell. She's so whimsical. Something, sometimes she'll do one thing and sometimes another, like a child. You can't depend on her. She's a tricky, too. She's tricky, too. I could tell, I'm sure, by your eyes. Hers are darker and the pupils are dilated, aren't they, usually? Yes, but Leah didn't daren't come near enough for that, don't you see? Oh, she must be in agony, poor girl. But how do I know? She may be dead. You forget that she has written to me since leaving. Oh, yes, that is a relief, but I may have heard her. Oh, Joy, don't say you could have. It was not you. It was e Edna. Well, how can I tell whether or not I'm responsible? I don't think she would have struck her, I said. No. She did once, though. She stabbed Leah with a carving tool on the wrist. It always sickens me to see that scar. Oh, she has a temper. Poor Leah. She lay back on the cushions again and closed her eyes. Her hand had relaxed in mine. I looked at her, so wearied and pale, and said softly, You just drop off to sleep for a while, and I'll think it over. 
She nerved her body and pulled herself up. Oh, no, she exclaimed. I'm dying for sleep, but don't you see I can't? If I should fall asleep, who would it be that would awake? It might be she. By Jove, I cried. I hadn't thought of that. I've thought of nothing else. That's why I've stayed up and kept awake while I am so exhausted. If Leah comes back, she must find me here and not the other one. I must see her and find out what has happened. We must arrange for everything and decide what plan to adopt to circumvent her. Oh, I must keep awake. Even as she spoke, her head dropped again heavily. You can't tell, then, when the change is likely to come. Sometimes I have a feeling, a premonition. Like that night, don't you remember, when I was so blue? I knew that I was going to change. But usually I can't tell. She has come lately, about two days in the seven, but irregularly. It's almost always after a deep, heavy sleep. You remember how late she used to lie abed? That's what worries me now. I'm absolutely exhausted, and if I do fall asleep, I'll go down deep. So deep, I'm afraid that I'll change. Can you think what a horror that is to me? I must stay up till Leah comes. You must promise to keep me awake by every means in your power. But even then, what are we going to do? How can we arrange a way for Leah to get along with her? That's where I came. That's where I come into the game. I said, I think I can solve that problem. How did you get on with her? Joy asked timidly. It was quite as if she were asking about another woman and feared to commit an impertinence. Do you like her? She added. She's not to be compared to you, of course, but there's much that's likable about her, and at least we get on beautifully. And so we shall this time if she'll only let me stay. That's the difficulty. Oh, she'll let you stay. She'll be only too glad. She likes you, Leah says. Her brows drew together, and I wondered how much she knew. Well, then, I'll undertake to make her keep Leah. Oh, if you can do that on any terms, we can stand it, both of us. Leah will suffer anything, I'm sure, rather than leave me. One thing more, then, since I must leave, I must have all the information if I'm going to do anything. What does she know about me? Nothing, I think. At least she has never been told, I mean. We've always kept it from her. She thinks she's the only one. I don't see how that can be possible. It does seem strange, but then, you know, she's mentally undeveloped. In some ways, she's a mere child. And then, too, she has never known it to be any different. Why should she suspect that there is another personality, that she isn't the real Joy Fielding? She's conscious that she loses time, so to speak, and she thinks it is only the fault of her memory. I thought it over a while, then I said she wouldn't say much about it to me, and so I didn't quite get her point of view. It baffles me. She must know that she does things in the lapses, even if she doesn't recall them. I don't know that she's even aware of that. She may think she's unconscious during these lapses, but most likely it is just like dreams. Even if we vaguely remember them for a moment, we forget them, and they don't seem to have been real. Or... Perhaps they're like delirium or insane intervals of which she has no memory. Why, a man may even be simply drunk and not recall what he has done, and that self is really a different personality. But I pursued, but I pursued, do you forget too? Yes, that is almost always. At times I have had vague, formless memories, as one has of dreams. That's about as much as this second life ever is associated with my normal one. If what I now have is the normal, how do I know even that? But I have known about the duality almost from the first. And of course, Leah keeps me informed of everything that happens. You see, sometimes I'm not even aware that there has been a lapse. I don't realize that it isn't just the next day. Leah tells her as little as possible about me. She's easily managed and pull, put off, usually, but somehow... All right, I'm stumbling here. Let's regroup. Let's regroup. But somehow, of late, she seems to have grown stronger. She seems to be the developing... Men she seems to be developing mentally. It frightens me a little. You don't think that anybody has told her, possibly, I suggested? There's nobody to tell her. Of course, Leah never would. Uncle Jordan... Oh, he thinks I'm crazy and he never talks anyway, I'm sure. He doesn't realize what's happening, for, after all, we're not obviously different. She might be taken for me in some queer mood, I mean, she added. King, I believe he thinks that I'm possessed of a devil, which I think I am. She paused to smile faintly. 
Anyway, he minds his own business. I have an idea that he has a reason for wanting to keep quiet. Or lastly then, the doctor. I put it hesitatingly, yet I wanted to know what she would say. Her answer was prompt. He wouldn't tell, I'm sure, why. He wants to cure me. It would spoil all chance of that, I think, if she knew. I wasn't so sure of the doctor after what Leah had said to me, but it would do no good now to mention that. She had trouble enough at present not to worry with her, worry her with new doubts. Then is it possible that she might have come across some evidence of you in your writings or something that would arouse her curiosity? Oh, I think she hasn't the least suspicion. As I said, it must all seem natural enough for her to lose time. She has always done so. Everything is accounted for to her by the fact that she forgets. Of course, I am careful to hide everything that is strictly my own. Anything, that is, that she would not understand. Leah keeps all my private letters under lock and key. I'm very careful, for I've been on my guard since it first began. How long, I asked. Ever since I was 13. That's when she came first. It's incredible, I exclaimed. Of course, I've heard of such multiple personalities of the celebrated ones, but they've seemed only like queer, improbable cases out of a book, monstrosities, or have regarded them as half-crazed or hysterical or somnambulistic. But you, Miss Fielding, you seem so beautifully sane, so poised, so complete. It's like a fairy tale. Oh, you are the white cat. You are under a spell. It's only because I'm not a poor girl that I'm not a mere case, I assure you. You don't know what a life I've led, how every physician I've had has wanted to study me or put me in a sanatorium or a hospital or an asylum or worse. Yes, if I hadn't the money, I should probably be in a madhouse at this moment. Do you realize how easy it would be for a physician to put me there? From the ordinary point of view, I'm virtually insane part of the time. I've been in great danger, Chester. But having some money, I've been able to get away from people and seclude myself and retain my freedom. If you call it freedom to be cheated out of part of your natural life, I have had Leah, and she was enough. She understands. She's loyal. And she is, above all, wise and good. But the doctor, what about him? Of course, I must have a physician at times, and Dr. Copen is a good one, and interested in my case. He has been most kind to me. Of course, I am interesting, though psychologically, and he's probably written a monograph about me for some medical society already, but I have him chiefly for medical troubles and to keep general run of this thing, enough to advise me. This was rather different from what Edna had led me to believe, so I said. He hasn't attempted to treat you for this psychological disassociation. No, he has wanted to. In fact, he's always urging me to allow him to see what he can do, but I won't let him. He wants to hypnotize me, but I don't quite dare. dare. Would you? No, I said, I'd advise you not to. If that's to be done, you ought to, to go to a great specialist. I thought I had a clue now that would bear following up, but I decided to think it over a while before I spoke of it. So intently had we talked that we had scarcely noticed the darkness, which had fallen until King's gong aroused us. Joy rose warily. Would you mind lighting the candles, she said. She waited till all the sconces were burning, and then, as I went to the window, she said, No, leave the shades up, please. I want the windows left so that Leah, if she comes, may look in. I feel somehow that she is near here, that she will come this evening if she dares. Why haven't you been out where she could see you, then? Have you thought to call her? She looked at me blankly. Why? I haven't thought of that. Have I? But would she dare come? Try it now, I exclaimed. I will. She went to the front door and threw it open and cried, Leah, 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 come here. It's all right. I want you, dear. There was enough in the scene, the stillness that ensued, the gathering mysterious twilight that shrouded the house, the tragic quaver in Joy's voice to make me thrill to its dramatic power. She stood there for a few minutes, all in white, waiting, her hands clasped on her breast, vividly illuminated by the candles. But no sound came out of the shadows of the night. Joy closed the door, then with quick second thought, she returned to leave it ajar and came back into the library. We had moved almost to the dining room when, on a sudden whim, she paused, turned, and looked toward the window. My own eyes followed hers. There was a dark face peering in, so dark that the whites of the eyes and the teeth were almost all that was visible, though enough to show who it was. 
Leah, Joy cried and ran again to the door, crying out hysterically. She called again, but no answer came. It occurred to me that the excited accents of Joy's voice might well be misleading, and for the first time I thought to try myself. Joy had returned to throw herself down, sobbing, full length upon the window seat, her heart breaking with the suspense and disappointment. The strain was too much for her after her hours of hope and fear. I did not stop to comfort her then, but ran to the doorway and stood in the lighted hall there in plain sight. Leah, I called. Come here. It's I, Mr. Castle. I want you. There was still no reply, but feeling sure that Leah must be near at hand, I started off vaguely in the dark. I had gone but to the turn of the lane when I heard footsteps running. Then in a rush, Leah was upon me and had seized my hand. Oh, Mr. Castle, I'm so glad you've come, but I was afraid to go in. I was afraid I might make it worse if she was there. Who is it? Tell me quick. It is my own Miss Joy or the other. It's Joy, I assured her, and she's waiting for you. You must come at once. She paused a moment, evidently wondering if I knew the secret. You're sure, she said. You know that there are two. Yes, I know everything now, and this is Joy, your Joy. She bounded forward, and I with her, stumbling in the dark into the doorway to the library. There for a moment she stopped, trembling so violently that her teeth chattered audibly. Joy was still lying stretched out at full length upon the cushions of the window seat. At the first glance, Leah did not see her, but then she ran forward, knelt, and threw her arms about her mistress. But the next instant, starting back as if she had embraced the corpse, she sprang up, and faced me. Her eyes opened wide in horror. Oh, Mr. Castle, she's asleep. Miss Joy's asleep. Oh, God. The creature's coming back. The creature is coming back. And so shall we in Chapter 2. Goodbye. Goodbye, bruv.